want to read together tonight, please. We're in the second epistle to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read the first seven verses together. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, <coughs> excuse me, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. I'm almost fainting, forgive me. <coughs> we'll try that again. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Amen. And as always, we just look to the Lord that his blessing will rest upon his own truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Friends, the Bible tells us that man is made in such a way that man has a need within him. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, it says, This is that light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every single person on the face of the globe tonight has something built inside him or her that makes him want to or makes him need to worship. Now, of course, as you look across the globe tonight, people worship many different things. All over the world, people in even the most remote corners and in the most out-of-the-way places, people still have an awareness of the existence of, of a God. Some will worship the sun. Some will worship the moon. Some will worship idols. Some will worship all kinds of things. But it's proof of the scripture which tells us that there is something built into every man that causes him to have a desire to look to something or someone greater with a need to worship that God, whatever that God might be. And people all over the world feel within themselves that need to worship. The scripture before us this evening speaks here of a God. And the scripture calls him here the God of this world. Now, before we go any further, I don't want you to get mixed up with this. Whenever Paul refers here, uh, in whom the God of this world, verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. He's not talking about the Lord God Almighty. He's talking about the God of this world. And there are many today who follow and who worship this God that the Apostle Paul is speaking about here in that verse. You know, it's amazing. I believe we're living in tremendous days. Tremendous days of time. It's amazing how spiritual awareness has increased in the world. Some of you young people watch films. I don't know whether you're into films much or not. I'm not really into them, but, but I pick up stuff here and there. And you know, it seems that films nowadays are being made, science fiction films, and people step through, as it were, a window into a different dimension. Or they'll step through, you know, some of these things that appear in films, and they're like, they're like water, you know, and they step through, and they're into something completely different. And it's evidence that those who write science fiction material are inspired in some way by spiritual things. Because friends, all around us tonight, we see it, we may not always realize it, but all around us tonight, we live in the midst of another dimension. 
We live in the midst of a spiritual realm. Every single thing that happens in the world around us is energized by the spiritual realm in which we live. And in this, these days of time, there's a, a new increase. There's a new increase in that. Okay, Stephen, I don't know what's going on there. It seems as if the devil doesn't preach this message tonight. Eh? He really tricked me at the beginning. Thank you, Stephen. That's what you get whenever you ask God to captivate every distracting thought. And I mean that. You know, we laugh at that stuff, but friends, I'm telling you, that's true. Listen to me. There are demons in this very room tonight. Oh, we don't see them, but that doesn't mean they're not there. And we live in the midst of a spiritual dimension, and it affects every single thing in life. Everything. 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 And in these days of time, there seems to be this increase in spiritual things. There's an increase of interest in Satanism. There's an increase of interest in things of the occult. And people are reaching into Eastern religions. People are reaching into all kinds of things in these days of time, looking for answers to some of the mysteries of life. That can't be explained. If you have Sky Television, there are channels that devote nearly every single hour of broadcasting time to people who are searching for ghosts. Because people are looking into the mysteries of life and people are wondering, you know, could another dimension really exist? The Bible has always said it does. But you see, man will not believe these things. And so people dabble into all kinds of things trying to, to prove this or trying to disprove something else. Do you know that they, they used to believe the earth was flat? Do you know that? Of course you know that. The Bible told them all along it was round. All along. It tells us in the book of Job. The oldest book that was ever written. And yet man chose not to believe that. And for years they thought you could sail far enough and drop off the edge of the table, so to speak. And I'm only telling you that tonight because... The devil, the God of this world, he's at work, friends. And this verse tells us that he blinds the minds of them that believe not. And in the search of spiritual activity, the search of spiritual things, because of this inbuilt built thing in every man, in the quest for spiritual reality and worship, people find themselves reaching into all kinds of things. To try to find the answers to life's mysteries. And so today all across the world we have different cults. We have different sects that have sprung up and people join. And people attend those things because they're looking for answers. Now I'm quite sure this evening. We're of course we're in, in, a, in a church this evening. We're here under the, the umbrella of the Christian faith this evening. And I'm quite sure that there's probably no one here who is into devil worship or into to anything like that. But I want to say this tonight. It is possible to follow this God that the Apostle Paul is speaking about without delving into Satanism or without delving into devil worship or into that kind of thing. Because the God of this world manifests himself in many different ways. And the God of this world that Paul writes about in this verse, he has, has people following him. He has people serving him. Some who don't even realize that he's the one, in fact, that they are serving and they are following. You see, if you mention the devil today to the ordinary man in the street, you'll get two kinds of reaction. The first kind of reaction is this, ah, no such thing as a devil. He doesn't exist. You've heard that, haven't you? The other reaction you'll get is you'll see people dressed up in black suits with two wee red horns and a grape. I don't know where you call it. a grape. In our farm at home, we always call it a grape. But he holds a grape or a pitchfork, whatever you want to call it. And those are the two kinds of reactions you get to the devil. He either isn't there or else he's a joke. I want to tell you tonight, friends, he's no joke and he is there. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that the devil is a, a being. The devil is someone who, who was created by God somewhere back in eternity and through pride, 
through the fact that he was, was made in such a high standing, he elevated himself and he felt, I could be like God. He rebelled against God and he was cast down. And he's now the God of this world in which we live. And people may choose not to believe or people may choose to make a joke of that kind of thing. But there are people all over the globe tonight who are following him and who are serving him without even knowing it. Now this scripture here calls him the God of this world. And I want to just look at this very quickly tonight. The God of this world, it tells us one or two things about him in that title. Because first of all, it tells us that he is in control of a temporal kingdom. He may be called the God of this world, but it's a temporal kingdom. He's the God of this world. And friends, there's coming a day when this world, the Bible tells us, will be dissolved. A day whenever this world will give way to another world, to an eternal world, to a better world, to a better state, to a better place, to a, com- a better condition. The things the apostle tells us that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. There's an eternal world around us and someday this world will give way to that eternal world. Peter speaks of the coming day when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. But he says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. This world will pass away someday. And so the God of this world, his reign, his authority is only something that is completely temporary. Another thing that that title tells us is that he is the God of this world. Now friends, the word of the Lord has much to say about the world, the world in which we live. The word of God encourages us, if you're saved tonight, The word of God encourages us to be separated from the world that's around us. Now please, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we've got to be isolated. I believe with all of my heart that the Christian church has gone through an era for years where we isolated ourselves from the people in the world. The Bible doesn't say to isolate. The Bible says to separate. That does not mean that you can't keep contact with people who are unsaved. You need to keep contact with people who are unsaved so you can witness and share the gospel with them. Our sister sang tonight about how Jesus left the gospel for the world. She sang tonight about how, you know, I love to tell the story. If you're isolated from society, then you have no one to tell the story to. You know, quite often the big problem is in life, whenever you're running a gospel service and you ask Christian people, forgive me, I'm off on my my hobby horse here, but whenever you ask Christian people to bring unsaved along, they're so isolated from unsaved people, they have nobody they can ask. Isn't that right? Of course it is. Now the Bible tells us we're to be separated if you're saved. You're to be separated. In other words, that means you're not to do what the world does. You're not to live by the standards that the world holds. You're not to hold the viewpoints that the world holds as being paramount. But nevertheless, friends, we live in the world. And we live amongst people. But we have got to separate ourselves from the sinful activities that are around us. James chapter 4 and verse 4 says that friendship of the world is enmity with God. He says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Christian friend, let me ask you tonight. Are you hand in hand with the world? Or tell me, are you separated for Jesus? Because I don't care what you profess with your mouth. If you're walking hand in hand with the world, the Bible says you're an enemy of God. And it's time you got on your knees and sorted that out before him. You know what your condition is tonight. Make sure you're separated unto the Lord Jesus Christ. But friends, the world offers many pleasures. The world has got many, many attractions, especially for young people. It's good to see young people in the meeting. And I know we're living in days, I know young people face pressures today that some of the rest of us know absolutely nothing about. And the world has so much to offer by way of of attraction for the young people. And the God of this world uses all of these things for his own purpose, to keep us following after him. Could it be that perhaps you're following him tonight? You don't know Christ. 
You can't say I stand redeemed as her sister sang tonight. You don't know Christ and tonight you're maybe unaware of it but you're following, following the way of the world. You're following after the God of this world. This verse says he has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Not only is there a God of this world that the masses follow, but here we see something in this title about the way he works. He blinds people. He blinds people. He blinds people from the truth about this present life. You know, friends, the truth tonight is quite simply this. That all that the world has to offer cannot fully satisfy the need that has been built inside us. That need to worship. And so we, we wander in sin. We seek after satisfaction. We seek something to, to fill that emptiness, to fill that void that's deep down within us. We follow after sin. We look for contentment. And we go deeper and we go deeper in the depths of sin. But sin will never satisfy. You know, someone once said that if a cigarette could satisfy, you would never have to smoke another one. You see, friends, sin can't satisfy the need. Oh, there's pleasure in sin. But the Bible says it's only for a season. He's the God of this world. It's a, a temporal kingdom. He's the God of this world that is full of sin. And yet, you know, there are people who follow him and they go deeper and they go deeper and they look for more and more, always searching, always looking for that next kick or for that next fix or for that next bottle or for whatever that next thing might be in order to give them a high to take them through. The God of this world, he blinds people's eyes. Friends, if the truth was to be known, these things are all superficial. And these things are all counterfeit pleasures. You know, the devil has got absolutely nothing original. Nothing. Everything that the devil has is a counterfeit of something that God has. You see, for instance, God has got a trinity. There's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The devil has a trinity. Oh, yeah. The devil has a trinity. The beast, the antichrist, the false prophet. And everything that God has, the devil counterfeits it. And so the pleasures that he gives, they are all counterfeit of the pleasures and the satisfaction that God gives. But the problem is they have no depth. Superficial. They have no lasting value. Because real pleasure only comes from a life that's surrendered to the God who put breath within that life. Real satisfaction and real pleasure only comes from a life that's surrendered to the God that built within that life that desire to worship. And it only comes as you surrender and as you worship him. You see, tonight, praise God, we worship a Savior. We speak about a Savior. We preach a Savior who died upon the cross of Calvary. But friends, tonight, he is the answer, and he's not just the answer for time, but praise God, he's the answer for all of eternity. Hallelujah. Because that's who he is tonight. And he's the only source of lasting peace and happiness. But the God of this world has blinded people's minds, blinded people's eyes to that glorious truth. Perhaps you, perhaps you have been blinded. Perhaps you're here this evening and you are blinded right at this moment in time. And all you know or all you see of Jesus Christ is someone who supposedly died for us on a cross some 2,000 years ago. But he means nothing more than that to you. Because tonight that's all you really know about him. And if you've heard the gospel, perhaps you feel that Jesus only wants to spoil your fun. Listen, young person, so many people feel like that. He's a killjoy. I have witnessed to people and they have said to me, ah, you know, I want to live life first. You know, I, I, I'll get saved later on in life. I want to enjoy life. And there's this 
thought that whenever you give your life, whenever you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, because there's certain things that you'll probably not want to do after that. Many people think he's a killjoy. He wants to wreck and destroy your life, to take the fun. I want to tell you tonight, Jesus is exciting, hallelujah. There's joy in Christ. There's pleasure in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's greater. You know, there's a group used to go around and used to say, Jesus Christ is better than ice cream. Hey, and he is, praise God. And I'm not saying that irreverently because he really is. He's glorious, bless his wonderful name. And he's not out to destroy fun. He's not out to take away joy. He's not out to take away happiness. But true happiness and true joy and true gladness, they only come through knowing him in a personal way as Lord and Savior. And many of us, well, we need to tell our faces, but many of us can testify to that tonight, can't we? Praise God. There's joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way. Joy that fills the heart with gladness every hour and every day. Isn't that right? Bless his wonderful name. And it's real joy, real satisfaction, real contentment. Praise God. It's real peace. Bless his holy name. And what's more? Our friends, it will last. Hallelujah. Because he will last. His joy will last. His peace will last. Because this evening he is Lord and the Bible says he lives forever even in the power of an endless life. Glory to God. But the God of this world, the one perhaps that you are following this evening, has blinded your mind and he has blinded your eyes to this glorious truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. He has blinded your eyes also as well or your mind to the fact that only Jesus offers this real life that we're speaking about. Only Jesus offers life that's more abundant. And I don't care where you look for the happiness or where you look for the joy. Many of us did that for years. But we found, praise God, that nothing offers what Jesus Christ offers. Bless his holy name. But the devil blinds the mind to these things. And the devil causes you to lose sight of the spiritual eternity that lies before us. The Bible tells us that there's a judgment for sin. In fact, the Bible says if we live in sin, then we'll be paid the wages of sin. And it says the wages of sin is death. Why do people die? Friends, people die because of death. Whenever God first made creation, man wasn't supposed to die. But death came because of sin. Death has come and death has been passed upon all men right from Adam down because of sin. Because the Bible says we have all sinned. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And death reigns. Death is classed as the last enemy that we face in this life. But the Bible speaks of another death. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. You see, friends, God is going to judge sin. God has to judge sin. He's a righteous, upright, holy God who can have nothing to do with sin. And whether it's in the life of the believer or whether it's in the life of the unsaved, God will judge every single sin. All sin will be judged. And those who pass out through death's door here on this scene of time, who are still in their sin, will face the second death that Revelation chapter 20 speaks of. And yet so many people, friends, they live their lives here on earth as if they're going to be here for a thousand years. No thought for eternity. No thought for what lies beyond. No thought about their sin. No thought about judgment. Why? Because the God of this world blinds the mind of people. That they lose sight of these eternal issues. And friends, we live in a day when mankind even flaunts his sin. You know, things that would have made you blush years ago are openly flaunted in our faces today. That's the day that we're living in. There's no shame anymore. There's no sorrow anymore. There's no remorse anymore. Because society in general has lost the truth about eternity. I tell you, the devil does his job well. 
He blinds people so well. The Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment, the second death. You see, the God of this world has blinded the eyes or blinded the minds of them that believe not. Let me ask you tonight, has he blinded, is he blinding your eyes? And I know I've asked that question two or three times, and I'll probably ask it maybe another two or three before I finish. Because, dear one, tonight, that's the important issue for you. You may be here. You don't know Christ. You're not redeemed. You've never had that time in your experience when you've asked Christ to save you, when you've asked Christ to forgive you, whenever you've looked by faith to the cross of Calvary and you thank him that he took your sin and he bore the judgment for your sin in his body to the tree. And tonight, because you've never done that, you don't know Christ. Is the devil blinding your eyes tonight, blinding your mind tonight? Oh, he does his job so well. And I believe it's so evident all around us. And he causes us to lose sight of truth. And he causes us to lose sight of the eternal issues, as I've said, that lie before us. That judgment. Death stalks us every single day of our lives. And dear one for you, no matter what age you are, whether young, whether older, you know, there'll come a time when death will put his finger upon your shoulder. And the moment he does that, you will not be able to say, give me a day, give me two days, give me an hour, give me five minutes to get right with God. The moment he puts his finger on your shoulder, you're gone. That's truth. And before you, if you die in sin, before you lies the judgment. Because God has to judge sin. Now listen to me please. He has judged sin at the cross of Calvary. Jesus bore the judgment for your sin and for mine. And whenever you look by faith to the cross of Calvary, he is your representative. He is your substitute. And instead of you having to pay the judgment for your sin, he, praise God, has already taken that judgment and now you can go free. Hallelujah. And friends, tonight, that's what the gospel message is all about. He took my sin and my sorrow, he made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary and he suffered and he died alone for me and he died for you. Oh, we like sheep, Isaiah says, we have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own ways. Listen to it. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He has borne the judgment for sin. And you either accept what he has done at the cross of Calvary and the price that he has paid and the judgment that he has taken care of. You either accept that and invite him with all of the joy and all of the satisfaction and all of the blessing that he brings with him. You either accept that and invite him into your life or you go out into eternity and sin and you pay the judgment yourself. And so I'm asking you tonight, where do you stand? Where do you stand? Are you in Christ? Or are you still being blinded? Mind unclear. Eternity unclear. Because the God of this world is blinding you for the reality that's around us and the truth about what lies up ahead for every single one of us. My friends, that's how he works. That's what he does. Do you remember how he confronted the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me close with this. You know, the Bible tells us Jesus goes down into the Jordan. He's baptized of John in the river Jordan. He comes out. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus is led of the Spirit, the Bible says, into the wilderness. He fasts 40 days. And after 40 days are over, the Bible says he's hungry. And the devil comes along. Have you ever really looked at that story? I tell you what truth's in there. He blinds the minds of people. And he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Spirit, Christ has just been baptized. The Spirit of God has just descended upon him. The voice is spoken from heaven. This is my beloved Son. 
And the devil comes to Christ, he says, if, if you are the Son of God, command these stones that they might be made bread. And he tries to blind Christ to the fact that Christ is the bread of life. And then he takes him up into the mountain and he shows him the kingdoms of the world. He's the God of this world. And he shows him the kingdoms of the world. And he says to him, you know, all of these I'll give to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. And he tries to blind the mind of Christ. Because the scripture tells him, tells us that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and forever. And the devil tries to stop Christ from holding on to that truth, to blind his mind to that truth. Then he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. Oh, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. For the scripture says he has given his angels charge over you. They'll bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Tries to make him fail to realize that he's the creator of every angelic being that rules in the spiritual realm. Every throne, every dominion, every power that's established in the heavenlies. Christ is supreme and he's above them. He doesn't need one of them. He's above every one of them. And friends, that's how he works. And he blinds our minds to truth. And you can be saved for years and he can still come to try and blind your mind to truth to keep you from going any further in your life and in your Christian walk. And so Paul sums them up so well here when he says the God of this world, because that's who he is. He reigns in the world in which we live. And the only way to have victory over him, the over, only way to, to be able to, to escape his clutches and his demands are through the one who's not temporal, but the one who is eternal our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To look to him to know the victory of the cross of Calvary. To look to him to know the power of his precious blood that's able to set every captive free. Hallelujah. For now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Thank God tonight he shed his blood so that sin could be forgiven, so that bondages could be broken, so that prison doors could be cast open, so that sinners could be set free. Hallelujah. Are you free this evening? Are you free? Or is the God of this world still blinding your mind? Blinding your mind. Friends, I have talked to so many people Talk to them about Christ. Talk to them about eternal issues. Talk to them about what lies ahead. And sometimes they just still can't see it. Can you see it tonight? I trust tonight that if you're in this service and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, I trust and pray that he will enable you to see it this evening. The reality of eternity. The reality of a sacrifice made for us by Christ at the place called Calvary that deals with it all and gives us the victory over sin, over hell, over death, and even over the God of this world, the devil himself. Oh, dear one, don't be blinded tonight. He's the enemy of your soul. And tonight I'm asking you to open your heart. Open your heart to the light of God's truth. Open your heart to the pleading voice of our Lord Jesus Christ as he knocks at your heart's door and he says, let me in. Accept me into your life. Let me touch you. Let me forgive your sin. Let me be a part of your life. I'm asking you tonight to open up to him. Respond to his claims upon you and know within yourself this joy and satisfaction of finding the only true and living God and being able to fill that thing that's within you, built into you, that need to worship because you've found the only one who is worthy of worship. Do you know him tonight? 
Will you open your heart to him tonight? Let's just bow in prayer. All I ask you to do this evening, whilst our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I ask you to search your own heart tonight. The Bible says, let a man examine himself and see if he be in the faith. What's your heart like tonight? Are you saved? Are you trusting Christ? Have you had that time when you reached out to him? If you haven't, and you feel him tugging at your heartstring now, do it now. It doesn't take a big fancy prayer. All it takes is a cry from the heart, Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me. Forgive my sin. Be my savior. Come into my life. And I want to tell you tonight, if you reach out to him like that from the depths of your heart, if you mean it, then he will hear your prayer. And he will touch you and he can meet with you And he can do every single thing and will do every single thing that you're asking him to do by way of salvation. So tonight I'm just going to give a pause for a moment. I'm going to pray in a moment, but I'm just going to give a pause to allow you to make your response this evening. And I urge you once again in Jesus' name, don't be blinded to the truth, but open your heart to Christ, who is the truth. And you will be blessed for time and for eternity. But dear one, the response is yours. And so I'm just giving a moment or two for you to respond in whatever way you will. Because you're either going to say yes to him now or you're going to say no to him. So you respond. And Lord, you know every single life that's bowed here this evening. Every heart. Move now, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Or there may be those in this service right now who are in the valley of decision. Lord, grant grant deciding grace. That grace that we heard sung about this evening. Grant deciding grace, Lord, right now, Father. We ask in Jesus' name that souls will be saved in this place right now. That hearts will be lifted and respond to the glorious gospel message that can set free. And so, Lord, I ask your blessing tonight upon every single person that's bowed before you. I ask your blessing upon your own truth, your own word tonight. And we believe the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. May there be those in this place tonight, Lord, now, who believe, even to the salvation of their souls. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.